This episode, I'm joined by Robert McNamara, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Franciscan University of Steubenville. In this episode, we discuss his work, Being a Person, Edith Stein's Mature Personalism, a Synthesis of Thomism and Phenomenology, alongside discussions on Husserl, Objectivity, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast, gain access to some exclusive content, or just keep everything running, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Robert McNamara, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. You're most, I'm most happy to be here, James. We're going to be talking about your PhD dissertation, which I believe is going to be, is slowly being turned into a book to be published yeah, at some so- point. Yeah, so it's been accepted by a publisher, hopefully come out sometime next year, and it'll hopefully be called Being a Person, uh, the, the Phenomenological and Thomistic Synthesis of Edith Stein. Okay. So I have Edith Stein's Mature Personalism, a Synthesis yeah. of Thomism Phenomenology. So the, the title's changed a little bit. The title's changed been morphed a little bit since then, yeah. So how did this, um, yeah, I guess it was for your PhD, but what uh, what drew you to Stein? Yeah, when I when I returned to the faith many years ago, I became very interested in Thomas Aquinas because he's a figure that stands tall in the Catholic tradition. And I entered in philosophy and theology studies, primarily in, in the study of St. Thomas at an institute in Austria, the International Theological Institute. Then when I was in seminary a number of years later, I ended up not becoming a priest. And But at the same time, I, I continued my philosophy studies there and encountered Edith Stein through one of my professors. Then when I set out on doctoral studies after I left seminary, the obvious uh, choice was Aquinas and Stein, and I was going to take them on the topic of the person. The reason why it was obvious is because the person was the topical area I was most interested in. Aquinas had done some great metaphysical ground for an understanding of the person, and Stein had this contemporary phenomenological experiential subjective appreciation of what it means to a person. And she'd done work in synthesizing these two approaches, and it seemed to me it would be good exploration to to see what she had done there, to see how she maybe had her own personalistic thought deepened by St. Thomas's metaphysics and how she maybe expanded and developed and bore fruit from her phenomenological reflections on the same. Mm. So you were interested in Aquinas. Were you were you drawn were you going to become a Dominican or just a just a normal normal priest? Like yeah, priest? I, I I when I entered seminary I entered in for a diocesan priesthood, but uh, I was at the time most close with Dominicans, a number of my friends entered the Dominican order at the same time, it would have seemed like a natural choice. And I suppose now I see in it the hand of providence to enter Dios and discover that it wasn't my vocation, discover that teaching could be my vocation, and then and then set out on a teaching path. Mm, I, see. I am, I suppose, close to the Dominicans and their, their way of life and their way of thinking about things. Mm, mm. You know, Aquinas gives you away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does. He does. Yeah, he well, does. before we jump in uh, with uh, with Stein and and Thomism, I have to ask you the Hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who do you pick? But I'm going to assume. Do we already have two two of the three there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have any any. Um, I suppose exceptional answer to that two of the three are Stein and Aquinas. Mm -hmm. And the third, I think then would be Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And I think of these three thinkers as somehow traveling in the same broad stream of philosophy. Aristotle, of course, in the ancients and Aquinas in the medievals and then Stein in the contemporaries. And in some way, doing the philosophical project in tandem with one another, even if historically separated. So I'd love to see them come together into a room and just listen over the conversation. I think that they have a lot to say to one another and find in one another's um, explorations and synthesis um, a lot to talk about. I think maybe we'd, you might, I mean, Stein is quite, um, academically speaking, she was extremely confident. You know, there's the yeah. the anecdote of her wanting to finally wanting to be confirmed and and baptized in the Catholic Church, and she sort of just reels off. He, you know, the priest says, "You need to wait. You need to do that." And she just reels off. I've read this, 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 yeah. this, this. Yeah. So, but I think maybe finally, in front of Aristotle and Aquinas, do you think she might sit back and? Seems it seems she always yeah. had a. You know her relationship with Husserl, her, the way she speaks of uh, many philosophers who she engages with. She has a deep respect for, yeah. for yeah. you know, 
philosophy. Yeah, she seems to be someone who has this unique combination of a reverential disposition before a master like a Sir or Aquinas or indeed Aristotle, and yet at the same time someone who's able to hold her own and and stand in her own understanding with maybe questions and and prompts and reflections or insights of her own. So I think she would sit at the feet of her masters in some sense, but at the same time, I think she'd take part in the conversation without hubris, but just genuinely a participant. Mm. It would be interesting to see as well what Aristotle would make of Christianity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what would be interesting about that conversation is what you just said, how Aquinas synthesized Aristotelianism with Christian Platonism, I suppose, philosophically. And then what would be interesting for both Stein, for both Aquinas and Aristotle would be Stein's further synthesis then with contemporary method of doing philosophy. Mm. And I don't think any of them would find it jarring what one another has done subsequently. And indeed, when I read Aristotle now, I think of him as a phenomenologist because mm -hmm. you read through his works and it's just painstaking descriptive to reach definitional knowledge and then reason forward from there. So he does seem to be quite experientially minded. Mm. Do you think of Aquinas? Or a phenomenologist, maybe. Do you think of Aquinas as a phenomenologist? I think he I think he doesn't show he's like one of these geniuses that doesn't show all of his reasoning. But there's a clarity of experience standing behind his reasoning that undergirds it. And you see a clean path of reasoning as the fruit of that. But you don't see the same coping exploration that you see in Aristotle or in these time. Mm. So outside of, the, outside of this synthesis and talking of that sort of phenomenological route, do you think what, what guides all these thinkers is, is you know, it's, it's famously said that with Stein, re the reason she came to the church of course, it was the truth of Christ, but it was almost foremost, what's the, the truth, right? Wherever the yeah. truth is, that's where I'm going to be. And, and Stein found the truth in the church. So she came, she came along, you know, almost like truth with Christ because she had to be where the truth is. So it seems with these three thinkers, there's an absolute march for certainty, which actually can't be said of all philosophers, yeah. to be honest. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stein has this wonderful line at some point where she speaks about all true philosophers searching out the logos of being, which she translates or can be translated then into English as the meaning of being. Mm. And so she certainly sees this in Husserl and Aquinas, and I think also in Aristotle. And this searching out of the logos in the Christian tradition is the searching out of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ incarnate, but it has a philosophical referent to something that Heraclitus brought up in, in Ephesus so long ago before Aristotle. And I think it would have been the guiding beacon of their common philosophical enterprise to search out the meaning of being. And I think this would unite them. And in searching out the meaning of being, then that's um, an attempt to attain to the truth of reality. And this is clearly what each of the thinkers are about. They're about the truth. Aristotle speaks so eloquently of it. St. Thomas has a work on truth and a Stein transposes his work on truth into contemporary German of her day. Then, of course, when the truth in person of Jesus Christ comes into the frame for Aquinas and Stein, this natural reflection becomes elevated to be at one and the same time a supernatural reflection. Not in such a way that for Aquinas or Stein, it undid the natural reflection, but it, it certainly elevated it, enhanced it, broadened it, deepened it. The question of certainty, actually, that you brought up there at the end is interesting for Stein, because she thinks that as philosophers, we seek a kind of certainty about reality, but that this is a divine kind of knowledge that's unattainable for us in the human condition until the beatific vision. And in a way, philosophy is the natural drawing us toward the beatific vision as we seek ever greater degrees of certainty and clarity. Mm -hmm. But in this life, it'll always be in some way mediated. We'll never, we'll never know with such absolute certainty that we can say that there's no further depth, no further expanse that can be attained. Do you think that was a disappointment for Stein? I think it would have been if she hadn't experienced conversion, because that philosophical problem then is theologically answered by the presence of God and revelation and the presence of Jesus Christ. So we have a philosophical problem. We want to attain to the fullness of being with mm. absolute certainty, but it's not possible to us.
I'd abs- yeah, I would be in absolute agreement with you there. I mean, of course, we can say now in retrospect, because we know what happens in Stein's life, but anyone who's read her autobiography and her writings before she either even begins the conversion or clearly converts, does see a sort of listlessness, a sort of like... Yeah. I don't know, even in her academic work, it's almost like, well, I don't really know. Like she doesn't, it doesn't seem like, why, why have you written this? You know, what's, what's this really connected to in the largest, larger scale of things? But then it all sort of falls into place in the way of empathy now makes sense being yeah. her first dissertation or her first major writing. For those that don't know, you know, her, her text on empathy, it's like, okay, this now makes more sense with the conversion. Yeah, the the, the truth was leading her forward and when she does convert and she looks back she speaks about everyone who encounters the truth encounters christ whether or not we're expressly conscious of that is another question but even to think in truth is to encounter him who is that truth at least in some inchoate way if not not to be fully clarified except through the course of time hopefully mm-hmm. So I guess to to sort of draw these elements together in your own work, the the key other element to bring in here, we've got Thomism, we've got phenomenology, we've got truth, we've got Stein. The other element is this personalism, uh, this 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 emphasis on the self, on the I, uh, yeah. which Stein sees as the of the utmost importance. Yeah, this was something I became interested in myself through reading of the writings of Karl Wojtyla, later Pope St. John Paul II. And so he had done something of a phenomenological and Thomistic synthesis also. And he brought to the foreground not only the objective being of the person, but also the subjective experience of the person, and in some way privileged that. And it seemed to me that this was an authentic introduction to the philosophical tradition that the modern period had brought about. So we often think of the modern period as a turn towards the subject inaugurated by Descartes. And at least in Catholic philosophical spheres, often the problematic associated with that is is emphasized. However, it seemed to me that Wojtyla, and then later as I explored her more, uh, Stein, recognized that in that turn to the subject was something authentic, didn't necessarily imply the problematic associated with it, and could and indeed should be integrated with the objective metaphysical presentation of the person that was given in early Christian and medieval times. And so when I saw that in Wojtyla, and then I later intuited in Stein, when I sat out in doctoral studies, I wanted to see how that was worked out. Mm. It seemed to me to be a true insight. I didn't have any um, great appreciation of how it could be worked out. And I suppose the exploration was an attempt to see how that was worked out. I had a, I had a, a sort of strong allegiance to Aquinas because of the clarity of his thought. And I wanted to see if it could indeed be integrated into his thought without problem. Mm-hmm. And I think Wojtyla did that to some degree, but given his work as priest, bishop, and eventually Holy Father, his, his, his life took him in other directions. It seemed to me then that Stein worked out that synthesis not only in its fruit, but to its depth. She showed how the reasoning could be followed through to its depth. And there you find, yeah, the preeminent position of the I, mm. Mm. Which, which you do find in the tradition, but not clearly so. Okay. Well, if I was to rip off the Band-Aid and ask you the, 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 you know, the question we've spoken here, you've spoken there of objective and subjective, how in all this, this grand sense here, how can you have the objective and still retain the subjective and vice versa, I guess? Yeah. Well, I think often colloquially we think of object and subject or objective and subject as somehow contrasted, if not antithetical terms. Mm -hmm. But there's a clue in their um, formation, they're both formed by the same suffix, that these terms are somehow correlated with one another. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that what we have in reality are things some of which have powers that can be directed to other things. When a thing is directed towards, it's an object. The power or the subject of that power, the being of that power that directs the power towards a thing, that's a subject. So what is a subject? A power or a being directed towards a thing, which is now its object. So my coffee cup, this is a thing and I'm a thing, but I'm a knowing thing. So I'm a knowing subject, and this is my known object. Mm-hmm. So 
it seems to me that object and subject need to be thought together. To be truly objective, you'll be really engaged as a subject. And we as persons are objectively subjective. That is, subjectivity is part of what it means to be a person. So it's part of the objectivity of being a person. Like if I understand you, James, it'd be funny if I took you as a mere thing. Mm. But looking at you now, I see that you're a knowing subject. I see it in the way your eyes look and what you're speaking to me. And so I'm taking you objectively as a subject and having a relationship with you in consequence. So why didn't Husserl put it like that? Why did I have to grind my way through the ideas to figure that out? <laughs> yeah, I think Husserl is so interested in as comprehensively and clearly as possible dealing with our subjectivity that his focal point is just trying to unpack the nature of that subjectivity to a high degree of refinement. And I think that's a worthy task for Husserl. Other phenomenologists need to take it in other directions. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I think put in, the, put in that way, it's a sympathetic view on his bad writing like i don't want to say he's simply a bad writer but it does it, it, it toes the line between like is this the worst philosophical writing that's ever been put to paper or is this someone who can't write in any other way because this is yeah. the, this is the only way it could be written where you're not going to slip up yeah. and it's not going to be taken in a way that he didn't want so it's so clear when you're reading him that he's he's almost like there with a like a i don't know a baton like making sure like no yeah. no, no you need to stay right on path here yeah, I think that's a great interpretation. There's going to be no ambiguity. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it sure that you understand what I'm saying and you see clearly what I'm proposing to you that I see. And interestingly, in the phenomenological tradition, I'm sure you're aware, Adolf Reinach was one of his most gifted students who was then the one who taught phenomenology to his other students in a, with a kind of um, basic clarity that Husserl couldn't maybe manage. So Reinach introduced them to phenomenology and then to the depth of what Husserl was exposing them to. But as a teacher, Husserl is in the background mining consciousness for all of its yeah. givenness. Right. Writing his, uh, what is it, like 30,000 pages of Husserl. Yeah. Husserl mm -hmm. what are yeah. yeah. And Stein had the work then for part of her life uh, as his assistant of collating some of this writing and putting it in public, in pub publicationable, in in a format that could be published there's some there's some criticism there right i haven't read this but some people are a little bit uh yeah. wary of what uh, editorial work with the sales work yeah yeah well i suppose with anyone who's working through such material and investigating and bearing fruit of the investigation in shorthand when it's collated and put together as a, a readable whole there's going to be a degree of interpretation by the assistant in this process. Mm. Uh, now, those who would be um, of Steinian leaning would perhaps um, interpret this interpretation as a, a, a legitimate interpretation of Husserl and an addition of Stein's own insight. Mm. Those who would be more antithetical to that would lean in the opposite direction and say this is a an abuse of Husserl but I'm not familiar with the history of that editing it's in pretty, any yeah. closeness, so I can't, pretty, I can't uh, pretty philosophically historically murky I believe Heidegger, mm. Heidegger gets his his in at some point as well so yeah it's all a bit yeah. Uh, yeah so we have this we have this Thomas synthesis with phenomenology brought in so you have the phenomenological phenomenological method, the reduction of consistently sort of going down to the phenomena, the the subject object, uh, the subject consistently having this phenomenological redu reduction towards the object or towards the objective to try and find the truth. But I guess one thing to bring in, which is in uh, sort of emphatically Steinian, is all throughout her career we see um, writings on forms of collectivity or at least forms of relationship which are extremely important to her so we begin with empathy then we go through yeah. to the state then we go through to the collective that is women um yeah. and so how do you also retain the yeah. you know the collective the group within this yeah so for stein would have very clearly seen early on in her engagement with the phenomenological movement that the act of empathy was a a key act of consciousness required for the constitution of the world 
as it is given for us as cognizing subjects. And so without the act of empathy, we don't have an ability to constitute the world together with its objectivity. Mm-hmm. To say in another way, the world as it appears to me is at least partly constituted by us two together in the world, taking various things as what they are. And so empathy is a is a primitive act of consciousness that's required for our constitution of the world, and we do it together with others. Mm-hmm. I I experience you as an experiencing subject and thereby in a way get a a view to the world through you and then we can both take the world as objective now this then i suppose in some way charts the course of her interests she's interested in the individual that becomes very clear because even in the act of empathy even in the work on empathy, she does reflection about how we're constituted as a psychophysical individual. Yet, at the same time, she's interested in the way we've got intersubjectivity with other subjects of experience. And this then shows forth in, as you said, her work on the state, her work on individual and community, her work on um, woman, that collectivity. And then it follows through into her later works after her Christian conversion and comes to a high point in finite and eternal being when at the very end she begins to reflect on the mystical body of Christ, Mm -hmm. the meaning of that human communion. And so it seems to me that you can see a a trajectory of her work that's definedly intersubjective. And this is one way why she doesn't fall into the modern problematic of the turn towards the subject. Mm. We're not trapped in our own subjectivity. We're not solipsistic. We're rather subjects together, experiencing the world in variously sized communities and associations, the ultimate of which is going to be the mystical body of Christ for her. So there's no such thing as sort of the modern conception of the individual here? I, I think for Stein, the individual has a kind of correlative priority to the community. And one could maybe think of it from this perspective, for her community is very clearly constituted of rational and free individuals, of persons, and those individuals attain their proper flourishing in community. So individual and community are in a way inextricably bound up. And one could say the most individualistic person in her conception ideally would be the most communal of persons. They're not they're not set ups of one another in attention. So it's in the, it's in their creation of their like radical individualism that it's actually been a refinement via what well, phenomenological empathy. <laughs> Go again, James. So, I'm sorry. so you said that uh, the most individual person is really because they're the most communal. So it's yeah, from so- that empathy of an, a consistent understanding of yeah. different people that they've come to a deeper understanding of the self. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you could understand it in a number a number of ways. One of the ways that you find very clearly in her early works is that our relationship to others and together with them to the world allows us to be exposed to values that we maybe haven't come to appreciate prior to this relationship. Mm-hmm. So just say you and me we go to a classical music concert and I have no exposure to classical music and you're a classical music aficionado. And I look at you experiencing the beauty of this music and I see upon your face and in your bearing the delight that this wonderful beauty is causing in you. This in a way opens for me a range of value that I had no appreciation of before the moment. And my act of empathy then has opened for me a sphere of value in the world that I can now begin to engage with. Mm -hmm. And what happens interestingly here for Stein is this starts to unlock dimensions of my personality, dimensions of my personality now that we're unexposed to this value are unlocked in my response to this value. And so my development as an individual is occurring through my empathy of your experience of classical music. And one can think of this then in relation to like moral values. So I see you as a man of great just bearing, and I've lived in a community that hasn't much justice. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen much justice in my life. And I suddenly see your, um, great distress when you see an act of injustice performed. And I suddenly now perceive the value of justice and this value of um, injustice. And in consequence, I can then begin to respond to that value myself. And this becomes a a foundational moral disposition then that I can take forward in life. So 
for Stein, it's very clearly the case that our development as individuals is not merely because we require the education of others so that it takes a proper course, but living alongside with others in our communities actually helps us to develop properly as individuals. Mm -hmm. Then if you were to come at it from the community side, communities are evidently constituted by their individual members and the shape the community takes really comes from the way the individuals are commonly recognizing values and having a relationship to values. So for Stein, a community is constituted because certain individuals come together in life and discover the same kinds of values together. The community, in a way, receives its constitution from its common orientation towards a value. So in in each of these ways, then, with value at the center, you see that the individual is related inherently to a community, and the community is itself constituted by the individuals that compose it as members. So do you think, do you think uh, biographically speaking, that this was Stein's approach to Christianity? You know, we see that there in, in the the tale of her you know, fatefully reading um, the, well, just happen, happenstance finding the biography, my, yeah, my, my biography, I think it's my autobiography by St. Teresa of Avila. And I guess in that finding with St. Teresa of Avila, that exact moment of sharing the, the, you know, an empathy of sharing and via someone else's experience, an understanding of what it is to, to, experience, I guess, this form of phenomena. And we also see it again with Stein in walking past the church and seeing the uh, the the woman yeah. who's just happened to come, quickly come back from the shops and kneel down and Stein sort of writing, writing in her diary that she was astounded that someone could just quickly take time out of their day just to quickly yeah. pop into the church and pray. And she found that, uh, yeah, I guess in that, in that moment is an act of this empathy that we're talking about. Yeah, I think that, that that's a good interpretation of these events. Maybe in St. Teresa of Avila's writings, Stein encountered someone who had a bearing towards the truth of God that she could understand and then begin to experience herself. Mm -hmm. And perhaps in her seeing that lady come in in the cathedral in Cologne and and just kneel before the Blessed Sacrament for a period in, in what obviously appeared to be a profound personal prayer, this enabled Stein to see, to enter into her experience in a unique way. And then maybe also another experience is worth um, picking out here. So she, after Adolf Reinach, whom I mentioned a while ago, had died in the First World War, uh, Edith Stein went to his widow's house to help her with the, I suppose, the processing of his, his intellectual estate. And she saw in his widow the power of the cross, is how she put it. And it seems to me that she could experience this precisely because as an act of empathy, like like you suggested. And in these ways, maybe the object of Christianity, um, God and Jesus Christ, were opened to her experientially. And if she followed through in that experience, then she'd follow through to an encounter with God. Mm-hmm. And these sort of spiritual stirrings really are the foundation of this 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 eye for Christ uh, for for Stein. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know that there, there has to be this spirituality. What do you what do you think it would be without this? Where do you think we're caught? Because I mean, even even Husserl, of course, it doesn't really come through in his work. But even Husserl is a is a Lutheran, um, and was a Lutheran most of his life, all of his life. Yeah, I think I think yeah, he he converted as well. I think I think he was originally ethnically a Jew. I don't know if he ever practiced the Jewish faith, but converted to Christianity, um, and so were a number of of the other early phenomenologists. Mm-hmm. So Schiller for a period was a practicing Catholic and a number of Stein's friends like the Conrad Marsh, Conrad Marcius, um, Hedwig Conrad Marcius. And so it was in her house that she came across the book of St. Teresa of Avila. And then of course there were others in the sphere like Dietrich von Hildebrand who were also practicing Christian, pra- practicing Catholic. So I think in the early phenomenologists, the phenomenological method allowed them to approach religious questions with a kind of objectivity Mm -hmm. so that they could see in the religious sphere a range of values, Mm -hmm. which values, if followed through, opened to them a window upon God, a window upon eternity, a window upon the things of God here and now in creation. And so um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think that they're, they're, 
practice of philosophy in the phenomenological way was a coincidence mm. toward their openness to the faith. Because phenomenology truly practiced is a is a really close attention to experience. Mm. And if the world really is created by a creator and he really has revealed himself, that open attentiveness to experience can possibly open windows upon the divine. Mm. I think the early many of the early phenomenologists experienced this. So what what were all those other phenomenologists doing wrong? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I suppose it, I wouldn't be historically well enough formed enough in what was happening in those spheres to to be able to adjudicate this or that person. But it is interesting to look back and see certain figures become fervently Christian, and others like. Heidegger is one of the most famous who um, becomes in some way involved in Nazi socialism. You know, the, these are, these are, yeah, I suppose they're mysterious, but no less mysterious than individual choice and the freedom that we have. We can take any tool and use it for good. It's almost, it's almost not to, not to, you know, make a cliche of it, but it almost you couldn't write it if you see the split between Stein as the Jewish convert who finds her way to God and love and truth, and yeah. uh, Heidegger as the the man who ultimately turns his back on God and moves away from seminary out of what seems to be pride and bitterness and becomes quite literally a Nazi. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a strange black and white split. Yeah, I'm sure that there's there's needed scholarly work comparing and contrasting historically the course of Stein and Heidegger's lives. Someone with a historical interest and philosophically engaged, I think there would be a wonderful work of dialogue, comparison, contrast there. And it is historically really curious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So I guess I guess the question then, the, the follow-up there really would be that in... in for, for, for Stein and for these other phenomenologists who have this spiritual stirrings, this journey could not be any other way. There, there, there couldn't be like a secular version of this. I think, I think it might be to go too far to say there couldn't be a secular version of it. I think phenomenology and its close attention to reality can really unveil the structure of reality and at the same time the structures of our consciousness and in that way it can illuminate our experience mm. and bring clarity and a comprehensive understanding to it mm. how i would argue that if that's ultimately followed through if you pull on all of the threads that appear before you you will find god mm. at the end of those threads but i don't think um yeah, I, I'd be reluctant to say that it wouldn't have a value without pulling on those threads to their ultimate point. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, if someone stopped short, was pulling a thread, and I'm not, I'm not going to pull on that thread any further because I see where it's going, then there's a problem. But to explore honestly the structure of our experience, it seems to me, is a worthwhile venture. Mm -hmm. So... The you know to to draw on your dissertation a little bit more where we now have this structure we have Husserl we have phenomenology we have Stein we have the personhood and Catholic personalism which is making a comeback um, where does Thomas Aquinas come into all this because on the one hand we have Aquinas come into this but then on the other hand we also have Stein's Aquinas coming into this yeah. because she's yeah. she's an autodidactic uh, yeah. Thomist yeah yeah so she. When, when she converts to Catholic Christianity, she first leaves aside professional philosophical exploration for a period of time. Mm. And in her own words, she gives herself over to the things of God. And she thinks that this is the destiny of a convert. Mm. How at the same time, she is at the point of her conversion already interested in religious life and becomes, of course, through the course of time, more and more engaged in the Carmelite way of life and eventually enters the Carmelite the Carmelite order, even though she has exposure to Dominicans and Benedictines during the course of her life as a Catholic Christian. During the period of time where she gives up philosophy, she encounters the writings of Aquinas and encounters in him the possibility of exploring philosophy as a service to the truth, 
which she already did, but understanding it now as a service to God. Mm. And this, I suppose, frees her to again engage in philosophical investigation. And so she takes up formal philosophical investigation then in the late 20s. She converts in 1921-22. Now, when she takes it up, of course, at this moment in history, St. Thomas stands tall in the Catholic tradition. You have um, in the university systems of the day, a kind of secular neo-Kantian phenomenological philosophy. And then in Catholic universities, you have an adept exploration of St. Thomas Aquinas. She, having been formed in the phenomenological way of doing philosophy, now a Catholic convert, needs to bring this formation into dialogue with Catholic Christianity and its intellectual foundations. And so St. Thomas then becomes for her a first point of contact. She also sees in St. Thomas access to the traditions that predated him, like the ancient Greek, Platonic, Aristotelian, the traditions of the church fathers, and then also the tradition that flows forth from Pseudo Dionysius. Mm. And so she sees these um, great intellectual traditions united and synthesized by Aquinas. And so not only does he stand tall at that moment in history, but also he gives her access to the history of, of philosophy as understood from a, the Catholic perspective. So having been formed now in phenomenology, she has the task of bringing these two very different ways of looking at reality into dialogue. And she speaks about discovering it as her proper mission in life to synthesize phenomenology and Thomism or phenomenology in the Catholic tradition with the pride of place for, for Aquinas. Now, it's, it's no easy task. As you said, she's autodidactic. She's no formal formation in scholasticism or Thomism. And so she has to introduce herself to it. One of the ways she introduces herself is she performs annotated translations of two of Aquinas' works, De Veritate on Truth and De Antidesensi on Being and Essence. These are the two most properly philosophical texts of Aquinas. And they're not merely a translation, but a kind of transposition she she doesn't just take the meaning of the text and translate it into German, but rather she transposes it into a phenomenological way of dealing with the same material. And so you can see in this, then she's really thinking through the thought of Aquinas, mm -hmm. but she's doing so as a phenomenologist. Mm -hmm. And then in her later works, after these translations, her task is to go back to reality. In my own studies, the reality of the human person explore it phenomenologically, but adopt into her exploration a Thomistic way of conceiving of these realities. Mm -hmm. And then she, in a way, tests this Thomistic way of conceiving of the person and sees in what way it fits and illuminates experience, in what way it requires adjustment or augmentation. And so all her later thought then is both phenomenological and Thomistic. It doesn't sit easily in the tradition of phenomenology or in the tradition of Thomism, but it's really an, an intellectual effort to grapple with these two ways of looking at the world and think them together. Mm -hmm. Now, when she does so in relation to the person, what happens is she gets this really robust metaphysics, the Thomistic metaphysics on the person, and it's been recognized, I suppose, in contemporary Catholic personalism as a seedbed of personalistic thought, even though you couldn't call Thomas a personalist. She has this robust metaphysical foundation, and yet she can think through it phenomenologically and add the subjective and the experiential and interweave these two ways of conceiving of the person so that we have a more fulsome picture. So if you think of the the, the so-called classical definition of the person, the person is an individual substance of a rational nature, something that Boethius crafted and St. Thomas takes up. When Stein thinks about this, she thinks about it from the perspective of personal subjectivity and introduces the I as the coordinating pole of the rational nature and its consciousness. And she begins to bring into the foreground the import of the conscious I. And so you could say that this is an inner first person perspective on what it means to be a person in contrast to an outer second person perspective. What is the person, an individual substance of rational nature? And then who is the person, a subject experiencing life in this rational and spiritual nature, conscious of the world and, and other subjects, 
thinking these two ways together, it seems you get a more comprehensive picture of what it means to be human, more comprehensive picture of what it means to be a person. Mm. There's almost there's almost always that element of empathy from Stein herself towards her reader going through her work. It's almost like there's this practical element because as you say, with the fact that she's bringing, she's doing this transliteration, she's really almost constantly going backwards. So phenomenology in this reduction of, right, we need to go right back to like, what's the most minute thing we can get to with Thomas Aquinas. She's really beginning from scratch. And then it's interesting at the beginning of finite and eternal being, which is almost like this, you know, a book that I'd love to tackle because I think it's up there with being in time, and uh, yeah. I don't want to say critique of pure reason, but it's it's. And it's I know as well, James is coming out in a new translation next year as well, so there'll be a greater access to the original thought to this. And it, it does need to be reprinted, but it's a it's fantastic at the start of that because if you were to explain that book to someone with this very classic philosophical title you know finite and eternal being taking on the big things and if you said to someone oh it's it's a synthesis of Thomism and phenomen- phenomenology in a Steinerian view you'd think oh man but at, actually at the start it's quite astounding she says really she's writing this f- for for beginners I think she even says yeah and it's actually a very accessible text this sort of Mag- yeah. you know, magnum opus grand statement of philosophy right at the end is right back to the beginning almost like a I want everyday people to be able to understand this and it's it's always interesting um to find that so much time is spent with stein in in small carmelite or lay carmelite communities to try understand her work and actually when you go to it you realize she at times she has this very like okay there's there's her soul coming through this is quite dense philosophy but a lot of the time it's clear that she's her audience isn't philosophers her audience is People who who are willing to spend the time to try head towards the truth, yeah. But she but she also hasn't taken so much from her cell to uh, make you yeah. never want to look at philosophy again. Yeah, she is an interesting combination of someone who can write and speak in ways that are very understandable, and who can also do that kind of dense philosophical work like Husserl was doing himself, where you really get down to the nitty gritty and think through all aspects of it. And you see in many of her texts both talents showing up she gets really nitty-gritty and and it becomes very dense and and a lot of times then it's a surfacing for air and and a bearing fruit from all of this dense philosophy and finite eternal being has that character too she does write it as a beginner for beginners and in this way she's kind of taking her her way of approach from aquinas and it's there's a kind of attention there because yeah finite eternal being it's basically about everything. <laughs> yeah. And then you think, well, the, the thinker who sets out on that task is incredibly inflated in their own sense of themselves. But she she sets out on it with humility and at the same time confidence that she can really encounter the meaning of being and theref- thereby hopefully unveil it for others. And so, yeah, finite eternal being is her phenomenological encounter with the meaning of being adopting a Thomistic conceptual worldview and testing it and then attempting to bear fruit for our experience. And the the upshot of that is that she takes this, what often appears to be cold and dry Thomistic metaphysics and puts a personalistic and subjective slant on it, gives it a personalistic and, and subjective bent so that you can enter into it. And so when she approaches the question of the argument of the existence of God, she approaches them from the perspective of the person and subjective experience. Mm. And this, in a way, opens a window upon reality that's compelling and alluring. You get all of the metaphysics, but you get it in a way that's that's um, that speaks to the contemporary man and in a way that can, can be understood. Now, when you approach Stein first, it's, it's kind of imposing. It does seem to some degree impenetrable at first. But I, I'm sure you've noticed this, James, too, but when you begin to crack the surface of the of her thought, you're really led into an area that's quite clear and mm. comprehensive. It's no longer impenetrable. One of the reasons why it appears so is she moves through things so so smoothly and quickly, and she never repeats herself. So you're left wondering what's the important point here. Yeah. But gradually if you spend time with her, you, you can begin to pull on the threads of her thought and follow them quite readily. So when students ask me what's the best place to gain access to her thought, it seems to me it's her public lectures 
most of which are just published in English in the writings on women, but there, there are other public lectures as well. And what you get here is the, the um, low hanging fruit of all of the philosophy she's been doing. There's a really robust philosophical backdrop, but you're getting, you're getting the palatable and compelling and understandable truth. So often if you enter her writings from the, from the perspective of those popular writings, it's the easiest access point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've found myself a lot of the times reading Stein's work, flicking back a page because I think, hang on, that's all you're going to leave. Like, that's all yeah. I need, but that's all you're going to leave me, you know? And it's, it, yeah. you know, especially once again, I'll, st- I'll stop uh, criticizing him soon, but especially con- compared to Husserl, right? Who yeah. spent yeah. 10 pages on something that could have been condensed down. But yeah, she is uh, almost like suspiciously straightforward once once the, the shell yeah. is cracked. Now, one, th- one thing I would say is what would you – what would your response be to the idea that when, as the foundation here, of course, is always God and therefore would be God's will, which upholds all things. What would you say to the, not necessarily criticism, though, as I said to you before we started recording, I've been reading Pritz, Eric Prisvara, who recently, yeah. who, this is his very clear criticism, is that, well, if we focus too much on subjecthood and the subject and the I and personalism in general, why you know we move ourselves away from the idea of grace in the sense of god's will is god's will what happens happens you know you are given great you you are afforded grace whether you like it or not and why are we focusing so much on the human yeah. will but i'm sure stein probably has some response to this yeah so i'll approach it from somewhat outside of her philosophical perspective first and this was a, in a way my tangential entry point to her thought I looked, I looked at her life and, and she seemed to me to be a person of great integrity and the witness of her life unto death and martyrdom showed that she wasn't someone who lived a radical individualism, mm. but her fate was in some way bound up with the fate of others. Mm-hmm. So when you have a contemporary thinker emphasizing the import of the individual and subjectivity, and yet with a life prepared, with a, with a, with a personal preparedness to go to death for others, you see something of, of immediate interest there. So I felt safe setting out on the turn toward the subject in modernity with her thought, given the witness of her life. So it's a kind of external reason outside of her philosophy, the witness of her life. But then as you venture into her thought, you see that her focus on the individual and on human subjectivity is not in any sense a retraction from the community or the world. A focus on the individual doesn't draw us back from community, but rather when we enter into what it means to be individual fully, we see that we're essentially integrated into communities with others. That is, you can't understand the isolated human individual. Mm -hmm. We can't live a truly human life isolated from community. So emphasizing the individual doesn't cost emphasizing the community. Mm -hmm. And she does emphasize the community as well. As I said, understanding our place in the mystical body of Christ is the ultimate end of finite and eternal being. What's my place as an individual in the mystical body of Christ? Then when you look at subjectivity, according to the understanding of subjectivity I gave earlier, where subject and object object aren't antithetical, but rather correlated, if you're really objectively attentive, you'll be more subjectively alive if you're really subjectively aware in the world, you'll be more objectively present. Now, you might have you might have noticed this before when you come across someone, particularly in the contemplative orders, and you get this sense that you're in the presence of someone who's really held, they really have themselves in possession, mm. and they seem really um, present to you mm. in, a, in a way that unnerves. <laughs> so like, this person really sees me, and that's wonderful and also scary because they really see me. Mm. And yet they seem to be really present to themselves at the same time. And it seems to me that there's there's a paradox of what it means to be a person and a spirit bound up in this. A paradox that Stein sees very clearly and is able to unfold for us. And for her to be a person, to be a spirit, is to be able to be poured forth toward the other while remaining fully present with oneself. So the paradox so, of the individual is that to be truly individual, you you should you can't yeah. be individualistic. 
yeah, you can't be isolated. You have to be in community with others. But you don't and really so, have a choice in that, right? Like you are. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't have a choice. You you're brought into the world like that. You are in community with others. And I suppose the, the challenge is to rise to that status in our activity and discover ourselves as poured forth for others. And thereby we become fully ourselves. One, I think, can rightly understand this as a, a philosophical interpretation or a personalistic interpretation of Christ's directive that you must lose yourself to find yourself. Mm. So uh, obviously losing and finding are antithetical categories. If I lose something, I haven't found it. If I found it, I haven't lost it. Mm. So there's something mysterious there. For Stein, Christ is revealing to us what we are as persons, as spiritual beings. What we are as persons of spiritual beings is we're capable of pouring ourselves forth for others. And in doing so, we come to ourselves more fully. You could say we become more individually ourselves in our outwardness towards others, in our openness to others, in our service of others. And interesting enough, Stein sees this already in the acts, in the acts of knowledge. So when I say to you, James, I know this cup, at the same time, I know that I know the cup. So reflexivity is bound up with my knowledge. I'm aware of this object that's outside of me. And at the same time, I'm aware of myself. And so my acts of knowing are revealing to me my spiritual nature, this ability to be present to the other, in this case, the cup, mm -hmm. while remaining fully present with oneself. So for Stein, this turn towards the subject and this heightened focus on individuality is not for the sake of individualism understood as a pejorative or for the sake of um, emphasizing subjectivity at the cost of objectivity. Rather, she's attending to one aspect of what it means to be human, and without which we will not understand what it means to be human. Like, what would it be like to be in a world with just objects? It would be a very cold world. Well, it would almost be the behaviorist world, right? Of just yeah. uh, e evolutionary reaction or response. And I don't know if you know many. No, well, I mean, I guess that world, there is no free will in that world. That would be the problem. Yeah, no free will and, and no interiority from out of which we look upon the world. I wouldn't look on you as someone who's looking back at me. I look on you just like I look in the books on your, your shelf behind you. You're just another thing amongst things. But the world would become a very impoverished place immediately if we removed subjectivity from it. And so Stein, I think, would say something like subjectivity is objective. It's an objective feature of the world, and we need to attend to it, to attend properly to the world. And we won't understand the human person without understanding subjectivity. And indeed, we have to give pride of place to the subjectivity of the human person. Like, if you think of friendships, what would it be like to treat your friends as objects, mere objects? Not like objects of love and objects of knowledge, but just mere things. Mm -hmm. It would, it would suddenly not be a friendship or a spousal relationship or a parental relationship or any communal relationship. If we remove subjectivity, we've lost everything authentically human. If we don't see others looking back out at us, if we don't look into the eyes of another and see them looking back out of us, we've missed the human individual. Mm. So I guess that the, the place of God really goes back to that, uh, uh, that, that sort of practical element in Stein's thought. You know, it reminds me of the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's a reciprocal relationship. And, you know, to to not necessarily please God, but to to love generally is to be to be loved by God is to love back and to love his creation. Yeah. So in that sense, God still holds the central place. Yeah. It's just the problem almost of this language around subject I yeah. individual right so as, as you explained you know the, the whole idea of like subjective as your interpretation but it's like we about it's your interpretation it's not really it's like the subject is always in relation to the objective yeah as you said so yeah a lot of uh, there's a lot a lot of work to be done i guess in that language there's probably does that change a little bit in the german no um <laughs> i suppose in 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 the English-speaking world, the term subject and object have degraded quite far, <laughs> such, that we, such that we understand them as antithetical categories, or at least in some way not inclusive of one another. Mm. But they're, they're evidently correlated. One doesn't have objects without subjects or subjects without objects. 
Now, of course, there is the divine subject, God himself, and he is his own object of knowledge and love. And so he's both subject and object in one. And then we who have been made to his image theologically, or we who are rational and at the apex of the hierarchy of being understood purely philosophically, have have an ability to access knowledge of God in a privileged way from the perspective of our subjectivity. Um, so this is something that comes across in, in Stein's later writings. She reflects upon the divine name given to Moses in Exodus uh, when, when Moses asks God, what is his name? And God responds, I am who I am, or I am what I am, or I will be what I will be. And Stein takes this as a theological clue to follow through on the philosophical depth of what it means to enunciate I, I am, I think, I will, I feel. And so we have a sort of privileged access to understanding the divine from the perspective of the subjectivity of the self, this ability to enunciate I am, I think, I will, I feel. And so what we discover then is that an appreciation of the subjective self opens a window upon God. Mm -hmm. Now, we can look out at the objective world and see it as his creature. But there's one creature in this in the world that stands within the world, but in some way above the world, the human creature. Mm. And the human creature, him or herself, then has access to understanding God from within, not merely by looking out at the world. And this interior access to God is heightened, and it's close to us, and it's something we can't get away from. In a way, my I am or your I am echoes the divine I am and gives us a window of appreciation upon what it is to be God, knowledge of God, privileged access to God. And so even if we return to our subjectivity and think of it as a retraction from the world of objectivity, what we find there, if we go deep enough, is that we are reflections of God and that our subjectivity in some way reflects divine subjectivity. And we have access to understanding analogously divine subjectivity from the perspective of our own subjectivity. So again, from this perspective, Stein is not interested in a radical individualism or subjectivity for the sake of subjectivity. She's not lost or trapped in the subject. As a subject, I'm present in the objective world. And as a subject, I have a window upon God from the perspective of my subjectivity. And from this, this is why the the soul becomes expansive and engaging from this relationship, yeah. this window. Yeah. It, not only is our own subjective self a point of contact with God, a way that we can come into relation to him, but the soul has been created for Stein as a space within which God can come to dwell. And this basic relation to God can then become a relationship with God. And, um, a return to self wherein one discovers the presence of God. And and just to, to introduce St. Augustine here, this is thoroughly Augustinian. One could think of this as a, a contemporary phenomenological development of insights that you already find in Augustine's writings. And so when Augustine says things like, God is more inward to me than my innermost self, mm. Stein gives us a way to understand that. When we go into the depth of the self, we discover not merely myself alone, but I discover there God also. And if I've come into relationship with him and live the life of grace, I discover him not merely through this window of the self that opens upon him, but I discover him dwelling inwardly within me. I discover his presence within me. Now, for Stein, in a way, the path of personal maturity is a path towards a journey to this depth, this depth where I discover who I am authentically and at the same time discover myself as a creature of the creator and discover myself as having a radical relationship to him that I can, that I can engage with personally. Now, this path towards development for Stein is not merely a retraction inward, but when I enter inward into myself in this way, I can in a way also enter into the objective world more fully. So one can think of it as like a telescoping happens. 
if I live on the surface of my being, then the world is superficial to me. The meaning of things is superficial. But if I begin to learn to live from my depth, if I journey inward in this way, then I see more deeply into the world. I see more deeply the meaning of things. And so when I journey inward, I discover myself, discover God, and at the same time, discover the objective world more deeply. And so nothing is lost in this attention to the subject, in this highlighting of the individual, authentically understood in a Steinian way. Mm -hmm. Lots of things we could follow through on there. Well, I was going to say, it reminds me, just in keeping with the Carmelite tradition, it reminds me of St. John of the Cross, of, uh, you know, in the cell with this one window into the, the world of this, you know, via the senses. Yeah. That always comes across as quite, some, sometimes it comes across as quite pessimistic. But um, I guess with Stein, there's almost this, this almost positive engagement, this expansion. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, first of all, she, she gives us a philosophical way to understand these insights of the Carmelite tradition. Mm -hmm. You could understand this from, let's say, a purely secular perspective. If you don't live from the depth of your being, you won't be truly yourself. The world won't appear to you with the depth of meaning that it actually has. And therefore, there's a kind of developmental duty that we have to attempt to live from ever greater degrees of depth. Then you follow through on that and you begin to discern there's a mystery to this depth. The depth of myself opens up upon the divine. And if I welcome him inwardly, then he can come to dwell with me. And at the same time, then I begin to appreciate his presence in the external world. I begin to see him, you could say, in the faces of others. And so there's a there's a holistic coming together of what it means to be human that's charted by the course of personal development. Now, like you could think of this as like, you know, the way sometimes the Aristotelian tradition is, is understood as um, self-centered. That is, we all want happiness. And so there's a there's a there's a self-centered focus to the ethics. It seems to me this is a wrong understanding of Aristotle because he understands the happiness not merely of the individual but of the community. But for Stein, it seems to me that the path of personal development is simultaneously a path of entry into self, entry into relationship with God, and entry into real engagement with the others of the world, with you and, and everyone else, and with even the things of the world. Um, again, I, I, I suppose I bring before my mind those contemplative religious that I have met who seem to be really present to me and yet at the same time seem to be really present to themselves. And there's a kind of dual presence here. You get the sense of they're living from the depth. They're really actually listening to what I'm saying and perceiving what I'm doing. And in this as well, there's the mystery of God. They're finding God in themselves and they're finding God in me. And so there's a holistic aspect to our understanding of the person and personal development that wraps together all of these matters, the self, the relation to God, the relation to others, the relation to the world. Did Stein ever um, sort of hint towards, uh, you know, it's interesting with with all the Carmelites, of course, you have the little way of St. Therese of Lisieux, you have St. John of the Cross with um, completely forgot the name of everything he's ever in. You yeah. have St. Teresa of Avila with the, the yeah. mansions. In the yeah. Carmelite tradition, you often find these fairly clear cut ways. Has there yeah. ever been anything, you know, in my reading, I never found such a thing with Edith Stein. I never. No. Um, it seems to me that one of the aspects of her genius is her ability to synthesize different movements of thought or different intellectual traditions or even different ways of life. And so she's formed in phenomenology and contemporary philosophy in the German speaking world. She then enters into the Catholic intellectual tradition, which is with its ancient Greek roots. And at the same time, then when she becomes more and more engaged with the Carmelite order and eventually enters as a sister of the order, she enters that mystical Christian mystical tradition. And then in her philosophical come theological writings, you get a synthesis of all of these ways of understanding. And so like her, her understanding of the soul and finite and eternal being is phenomenological, it's Aristotelian Thomistic, and it's Carmelite mystical. 
And she doesn't understand these ways of understanding the soul as as cobbled together or different dimensions. She really does think them together. In accord with Aquinas and Aristotle, the soul is the form of the body. And yet the soul has this inner depth in accord with a Carmelite mysticism. And she really descriptively lays out both aspects of this from the perspective of her phenomenology. So maybe the 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 reason why there's not one thing highlighted so much is that she's synthesizing the many things that she's encountering. However, given this synthesis, I think one could say that her doctrine on the soul is uniquely um, explanatory. It really does answer the questions you have about the soul if you look at it metaphysically, phenomenologically, even psychologically, and then, of course, also spiritually. And so there's this holistic doctrine of the soul that I think is something that she's genuinely contributed to to the contemporary church and contemporary society more broadly. And then also her science of the cross. So for, for your listeners who aren't aware, her last work was the science of the cross. She was writing it as a commemoration of St. John of the Cross's life for her Carmelite order. And she left the work uncompleted when she was taken by the Nazi socialist military to Auschwitz. Now in that work, she develops the idea that as human and as Christian, we learn the science of the cross if we give ourselves over to accepting the sufferings of life. And that this science, unlike other sciences, isn't a general doctrine, but rather is something that each of us enter upon individually. And we individually experience and come to knowledge of this science through the course of our own lives, together with its vagaries and their sufferings. And it seems to me that if there was a unique theological doctrine that she highlighted, it was um, an understanding of this science, how to enter into it, how to meet Christ in it, how to discover it as meaningful, and in consequence, how to suffer with maybe something like the same nobility that she herself suffered. And she suffered quite a lot. Of course, there's the martyrdom itself, but also imagine being such a gifted intellect, so um, able to teach philosophy and not able to be a professor, first of all, because she was a woman, and then later because she had been ethnically a Jew. Um, this would be unique suffering. She wrote a number of major philosophical works so that she could teach as a professor in Germany, and none of it was acceptable, not because of her philosophy, but because of things that are in a way exterior to her philosophy. Then to um, convert to Catholicism and to, in consequence, not be accepted by her mother and, and her family more generally, and the Carmelite life itself, when she entered the, the order, is a life of suffering for the sake of others. And then, of course, at the end of her life, to leave aside all of these major philosophical works, finite and eternal being and the theological work, the science of the cross, to be taken to Auschwitz, to be gassed as, as, a, as a Jew. There's, there's, there's a lot of suffering there born with great grace. And I think the witness of her life is borne out in her philosophy. So she has this, this wonderful concept in, in her, all throughout her philosophy, but it comes more to the foreground in her later works, the idea of being a bearer. Mm -hmm. And so something you've mentioned already is the I is the bearer of conscious experience. And so she develops this concept of bearer from a number of perspectives, but you then also see in the science of the cross the, the individual Christian or the individual human who suffers with acceptance bears their cross together with Christ. And in this discovers in some way the meaning of their being, the meaning of their being this individual and their own personal development and growth is in some way wrought by that. So I think these two, um, these two teachings, her teachings on the soul and her teachings on the science of the cross may be something that she could be, could be known for in the future. But given the the broad synthesis of her work, there's probably many other strands other th other Stein scholars would put before you. Mm -hmm. Is that where you might advise people to begin with Stein's work, the science of the cross? Yeah, um, I would, and I wouldn't. I would because it's very readable and it's a wonderful spiritual work. So if you're a Catholic Christian and you're 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 
you're engaged in the faith, perhaps it's a good point of, of encounter. Then her, her writings on education in the 1920s, given us popular talks, some of them are in English in her writings on women and, and some of them are independently translated into English. So there's, there's one wonderfully short work on truth and clarity in teaching and education. And I'd really recommend that as a, as a, as a, it's only maybe f- five to eight pages long and it gives you Stein's sense of teaching and education. And she was an educator for so long in her life that you, you get a kind of window into her interests and, in many ways, into some of the major themes of our philosophy, the themes of the person and personal development. And when uh, when is your book on Stein going to be released? Yeah, so um, I'm hoping it comes out next year. The publisher said it'll hopefully be next year. And um, yeah, it'd be, the, the work originally began as a doctoral dissertation. And there I was engaging with Stein's integration of Thomistic metaphysics into her phenomenology of the person. And after I finished doctoral studies, I spent a few years trying to make it readable as book, make it into book form. And so it's it's called Being a Person, and it's a mature personalism, a synthesis of Thomism and phenomenology. And I hope, in a way, it makes her personalism more known, more accessible, Um having if if people do read it that they they, they go to her writings herself and and maybe i afford for them certain ways to help them understand it Mm. yeah i look forward to it being released um yeah is there anything you'd like to to add about stein or your your work that you know we haven't touched on no i think we touched upon a lot of the major themes i think uh stein is interesting the exploration of her work is is growing. More and more of her works are being translated into English, though this is a slow process. Some of the works that are most accessible in German will hopefully in the recent in the near future be translated. And then her thought will become more accessible in the English speaking world. And I suppose it it is my hope as one who studies her that she will become better known. I think from the subjects that we touched upon during the course of our conversation, we can see that she's got a lot to say in a lot of different areas. And so if you're metaphysically engaged, phenomenologically engaged, psychologically engaged, spiritually engaged, she's got stuff to say on all of these matters. So yeah, hopefully um, this podcast will uh, (laughs) encourage people to return to her work and read it. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Well, that seems like a good place to finish up. Um, Robert McNamara, thanks very much. Thank you, James.